Hi everyone. In this video, Tim and I are going to cover um, the important things of Experiment 3. Uh, by now, you're probably familiar with the outlines available in the description below. And um, you know, remember how it's color coded. So we strongly recommend that you uh, download this outline and take a quick look at it uh, before uh, watching this video because it might give you some ideas of you know things you might want to jot down as we go through the video because we're going to touch on pretty much everything here. Although we aren't going to do the calculations for the solutions you need to make, we are going to do some example calculations uh, for another solution uh, that are very, very similar. So I would strongly recommend uh, taking a look at the outline uh, before viewing the rest of this video. So what I want to do now is um, talk about some basics of assets and bases and buffers and things like this. Now you've had all this stuff in Gen Chem but I do want to review it because maybe it's been a while or whatever, and I just want to quickly go over it. After that, Tim is going to talk about uh, what we're trying to accomplish in this actual experiment where you're actually going to make a buffer solution. And then um, we'll talk about uh, some example calculations and relate them to some calculations that you're going to need to do uh, to be successful uh, in this experiment. As always, some of those calculations, most of those calculations you're going to do before you come to lab, uh, which is going to make your life a lot easier when you get to lab. So without further ado, let's get started. Acids and bases. So according to Bronsted and Lowry, there are other definitions, of course. There's the Arrhenius definition um, and there's the Lewis definition. But we're going to stick with the Bronsted-Lowry definition today. Acids are proton H plus donors. And bases are proton or H plus acceptors. So acids, like hydrochloric acid, donate H plus. H with a positive charge is a proton, right? Hydrogen ion is a proton, so we call it proton. Bases accept these protons. And in buffer solutions, we need to use a combination of a weak acid and its conjugate base. Of course, a buffer can be made by using a weak base and its conjugate acid as well, uh, but we're going to focus more here on the weak acid conjugate base uh, type of buffer. They work functionally the same way. So how do I identify a strong um, acid or a strong base? Well, one thing we kind of have to do for strong acids is kind of memorize them. So hydrochloric, hydrobromic, hydroiodic, H, this should say HCl, um, HCl, HBr, and HI are strong acids. Nitric acid, sulfuric acid, perchloric acid, these are all um, undoubtedly strong acids. There are some um, other types of acids that can, can be considered strong, and you might wonder why people don't agree um, what a strong acid is, but that's not super important. It's like saying if a person is tall, people might have different standards for what that is. So it's the same thing for strong acids. In this course, we can consider all other acids weak acids. So there's a long list of weak acids. So if we know that there are six strong acids, we can consider all other acids weak acids. So now what I want to look at as a reminder is, well, how do these weak acids behave in water? So HA is used to represent a weak acid. It's not one of these strong acids, so it's going to behave as a weak acid. You'll notice that when it's a weak acid, we have this equilibrium arrow. And for weak acids, the equilibrium strongly favors, so the longer arrow is the left-hand arrow, the acid in solution. But some of this weak acid will donate a proton to water. So HA donates a proton to water. Remember, acids are proton donors. In this case, water is accepting that proton so that it's going to be the proton acceptor. What you end up with is H2O becomes H3O, so it gains an H, but it didn't just gain H, it gained H+, plus, so now it has a positive charge. And A didn't just lose H, it also lost a positive charge, so it becomes A-. minus. So HA acts as an acid, donating a proton to water. Water acts as a base, accepting a proton from HA. This is a uh, an acid-base pair. The thing that gains the proton, water in this case, now has an extra proton that it wants to get rid of. And something that donates a proton is an acid. So we consider H3O plus the conjugate acid of water. Put simply, the thing that acts like a base has a conjugate acid. Now, once HA loses the H, it's A minus. A minus wants to gain a proton, so it acts as a base. 
So HA is the acid and A minus is the conjugate base. And again, this is basically how this works. So we have an acid reacted with a base to form a conjugate acid at a conjugate base. And this is all in equilibrium. Well, this is, of course, review. And now we want to talk about, well, how are we going to make a buffer? And before we talk about how we're going to make a buffer, we need to remember what a buffer is. A buffer is a solution that, re that um, basically maintains its pH when acids and bases are added. Your blood is a good example of a buffer. So if there's acids or bases introduced into this into one system, they don't want we don't want a large change in pH in our blood because it would cause you know different things not to work properly. And I'm not going to get into that too much here. But we don't want a large change in the pH, so blood is a buffered solution which resists changes in pH when both an acid and a base are added. Well, how are we going to make a buffer solution? Well, it turns out that it's relatively easy to make a, a buffer solution. We mix a weak acid, in this case, we're gonna mix HA with its conjugate base. In this case, the conjugate base is A minus as we just discussed before. So A minus is the conjugate base of HA. Now remember, you can't put A minus or any negatively charged ion in a bottle, right? You can't have a bunch of negative ions next to each other, they would repel each other. So you need a counter ion. The counter ions that are very common, sodium, potassium, 1A metals, it doesn't have to be. Um, but in this case, we have a 1A metal sodium. So NaA dissociates in water to form Na plus and A minus, as you saw previously in a previous experiment where we, did, we dissolved um, NaCl in water. So if we mix HA and NaA together, we have made a buffer, weak acid and its conjugate base. Why does this work? Well, this solution contains both A minus and HA. It contains both of these species. So if acid H plus or H3O plus, depends on which textbook you use for gen chem, um, is introduced into the system, A minus will react with that H plus to form HA. But HA is a weak acid, so it doesn't change the pH significantly. So essentially what happens is the A minus is um, consuming any acid that is added into solution, forming a weak acid, which does not appreciably change the pH. What happens if we had a base, bases, a strong base like hydroxide, OH minus? Well, this OH minus will react with the weak acid, HA, and take a proton. And I missed something here. This should say A minus plus water. A minus is a weak base, so it doesn't have a significant change in the pH, and it forms H2O, water, so therefore it's resisting a change in pH. So adding acid makes more HA, adding base makes more A minus, and these buffer solutions can resist changes in pH. What are you actually going to do in this lab is we're going to talk about in just a few minutes, but I just want to continue with the review. One uh, equation that helps us that you've seen before when we um, when we uh, are dealing with buffers is the Henderson Hasselbalch equation, which says the pH equals the pKa plus the log of the concentration of A minus over the concentration of HA. This is basically the same as the Ka equation, except we took the, the negative log of everything, uh, which gives us pH and pKa, which is the negative log of H plus and the negative log of the Ka, um, and then it gives us this um, equation. So in this case, the conjugate base goes on the top and the weak acid goes on the bottom, and we can relate the pH and the pKa of the um, buffer solution. Generally speaking, if you have a uh, weak acid, you can make a buffer that's about plus or minus one of its pKa. So if its pKa is seven, you can make a buffer between a pH of six and a pH of eight. So minus one to six, plus one to eight. Um, and that's basically how it works. There's another thing that we need to notice because we're going to use this to actually experimentally find the pKa of the acid. And if you have um, taken general chemistry here, believe it or not, you did exactly this in a general chemistry lab. There is a point at which the pH equals the pKa. And that point is when the log of A minus over HA is equal to zero. Well, how do we make the log of A minus over HA zero? 
then we have to make the concentration of A minus equal to the concentration of HA. Remember that these brackets mean concentration. So if these two things are equal, A minus divided by HA, if these are both the same number, equals 1. The log of 1 is 0. So when the concentration of A minus over is equal to the concentration of HA, this term becomes 0. Said another way, pH equals pKa. And this is how we're going to experimentally determine the pKa of this acid, um, in this case, that you're going to use. Finally, we're going to use a pH meter. And you'll remember that pH is the negative log of concentration of H3O plus or concentration of H plus. So what we're going to do is use a pH meter to actually measure this. And a pH meter, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail here, essentially uses a um, glass electrode that is sensitive to hydrogen ions. So it detects H plus, basically um, a conductivity meter for H plus only is essentially how it works. And it de de uh, detects these H plus or H3O plus ions independent of the other ions. So this is then converted into a pH, which you're going to read um, directly from Microlab. And we can show you um, basically how to do that uh, later on in this video. Finally, a couple more things that I want to uh, talk about before, by way of introduction before Tim talks about uh, some of the experimental details in this equation, uh, in, this, uh, in this experiment. So the acid that we're going to use is monobasic sodium phosphate monohydrate. Okay, which may not seem like an acid you have seen before, but this is basically uh, a monosodium derivative of phosphoric acid. So it is, by its chemical formula, NaH2PO4.H2O, because it's monohydrate, one water molecule. Essentially, when you dissolve this in water, it acts as a source of H2PO4 minus. And H2PO4 minus can react with water, and this acts as an acid. So it donates a proton to water to form H3O plus. So water acts as the base, it accepts a proton to form its conjugate acid, H3O plus. And what's left is HPO4 2 minus. Notice this is minus, this is 2 minus because it lost H plus, and this has two H's and this only has one H. So this is the acid and this is the conjugate base. Well, H2PO4 minus is a weak acid. Its conjugate base is HPO4 2 minus. Well, you can't buy HPO4 2 minus directly because you'd have a bunch of two negative ions and they're not going to be stabilized by anything. What you can buy is dibasic sodium phosphate, which happens to be a heptahydrate. It happens to have seven water molecules coordinated to it. So we buy Na2HPO4.7H2O. But when we dissolve this in water, this acts as the conjugate base. HPO4 2 minus because it has two sodiums, they dissociate and the water molecules um, just become part of the solution. And this is what we essentially end up with in solution. So this is the weak acid. This is the conjugate base, if you will, that we're actually going to be using in this lab. And if we now write the Henderson Hasselbach equation with our ions, you could see that it ends up like this. So it's the concentration of the weak. Uh, conjugate base HPO4 2 minus over the concentration of the acid H2PO4 minus. So it's really important that you're familiar with which one is the acid and which one is the base. And in the previous discussion, I explained that. So now I'm going to talk, uh, turn this over to Tim, who's going to tell you what exactly you're going to do with these weak acids and weak bases um, and how you're going to make these buffer solutions and what is expected of you during this lab. For this part of the video, we're going to go over a brief discussion of what you're going to be doing in the lab before we actually go through the calculations on how to figure out what you're going to do in the lab and what you're going to be doing with that information. So for this experiment, the first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to prepare two solutions. The first of those solutions will be a 250 milliliter solution that is 0.25 molar monobasic sodium phosphate monohydrate, your acid in this case. So you're going to need to make that solution in a 250 milliliter volumetric flask uh, by weighing out the appropriate mass of the monobasic sodium phosphate monohydrate and adding it to the 
volumetric flask, then diluting to 250 milliliters. You're going to want to do the exact same thing with the dibasic sodium phosphate heptahydrate, your conjugate base in this case, but it's going to be a different mass because it has, of course, a different uh, molar mass. You should calculate how to do each of those solutions, how to make them, before you come to lab, so that way you're not spending that time in lab trying to figure that out. Next, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to mix an equal volume in this case of this lab, 50 milliliters of each solution, in order to make your buffer solution. The reason we're doing that is so that the concentration of the acid and conjugate base are the same, so that when we look at the um, Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, the, the log of the concentration of the uh, acid to the conjugate base, which is 1, the log becomes 0, so the pH is equal to pKa. So once you've made your uh, 50 mil your solution using 50 milliliters of each of your two 250 milliliter solutions, you will measure the pH and that will be the pKa of your solution. Once you've determined the pKa, you're going to make three new separate solutions. And the goal will be for those three solutions to have the pH assigned to you by the TA. You're going to use the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation in order to determine the ratio of uh, the sodium monobasic sodium phosphate monohydrate to the dibasic sodium phosphate heptahydrate. And to do that, you're going to need to uh, plug in the pH that is assigned for you and the pKa, which you experimentally determined in the previous step. Once you've done that, you can calculate the uh, ratio of the acid to the conjugate base, which we'll show you an example of in just a little while. Next, you're going to want to measure the pH of each of those solutions that you've made. Uh, theoretically, the pH should be close to your assigned solution, and you'll want to then calculate on the accuracy, comment on the accuracy and precision of your solution making. Uh, you'll do this in the case of precision by calculating the RSD, which, if you remember, is the calculation we perform in order to determine precision and for the accuracy you'll be calculating it uh, based on the percent error you'll be using the value provided by the TA as your accepted value in this case so you will want to compare the pH the average pH that you measure to the assigned pH from the TA finally you'll want to be testing each of those buffer solutions so what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to take one molar HCl, which you'll have to make in class. Again, you should figure out how to make that uh, one molar HCl from 12 molar, and you should have that calculation done ahead of time, and how to make one molar NaOH from solid NaOH, which again should be done ahead of time, as well as the 0.025 molar salt water from solid NaCl that you should calculate ahead of time. Each of those three calculations for making those solutions can be done before you come to lab so that you don't spend precious lab time doing that. Uh, you'll want to make sure that you're very cautious when handling the concentrated 12 molar HCl and the solid NaOH as these uh, chemicals can be dangerous. Once you've made those two solutions, you'll want to add 2 milliliters of the new HCl solution to one of the buffer solutions and uh, separately to the 0.025 molar salt water solution and measure the pH. Next, you'll want to take 2 milliliters of 1 molar NaOH that you made and you'll add that to the buffer as well as adding 2 milliliters to the 0.025 molar salt water, and you'll want to measure the pH. In both cases, you'll want to compare the change in pH when you added the acid or base to the buffer versus when you added the acid or base to the salt water. Before you come to lab, you should have an idea of what you expect to happen in each of those cases. Next, we're going to take some time to show you uh, what you'll be doing and calculating in this experiment. But first, I want to stress to you uh, some of the safety concerns when working with the concentrated HCl. Um, it's important that you remember that when you're making dilute acids from concentrated acids, you always want to add your acid to a stock water solution. You do not want to add water to the uh, correct amount of acid. By adding the acid to water, you're going to generate a very dilute solution at any given time, whereas if you were to add water to the acid directly, you'll create very concentrated amounts of HCl, which can sputter and spray up into your face and uh, form HCl gas, all of which is dangerous. So please make sure you're adding acid to water and not the other way around. 
Before we get into the math of what we're going to be doing in this experiment, I just wanted to briefly show you how to calibrate the pH probe, because it's something you'll have to do when you start your experiment. So as always with Microlab, we're going to open up the Microlab software and hopefully see our reading from flash memory blue bar filling up. Once it does, we will go ahead and our software will open and we will choose to open a new Microlab experiment. And we're going to, just like we did with the conductivity probe, add a sensor. This time we want to choose to add a pH slash DO sensor. We again have to click inside of the red box on the picture of the microlab and choose pH. Now this time, because we're going to be calibrating it uh, individually, we need to choose to calibrate the sensor. Once we get to the screen, we will tell it that we're going to perform a new calibration. Now you can't see it because I'm showing you the computer screen, but I have three separate solutions currently. One is a uh, pH 4 buffer solution, one is a pH 7, and one is a pH 10 solution. And these are the three solutions that I'm going to use and you're going to use in order to calibrate your pH probe. So to calibrate the pH probe, currently I have it sitting in a beaker of water, and I'm going to choose to add the calibration point. Once this screen shows up, I'm going to do my pH 4 solution first, so I'm going to change this actual value to 4. I'm going to take my pH probe out of the water and put it into the pH 4 buffer solution. What you want is for this red bar here to get inside of the green, uh, the wider green bar and stay as steady as possible. Once it's steady, you can stop swirling and hit OK. Now you have your first point saved. You'll want to take your pH probe out of the pH 4 buffer solution and swirl it in the water so that you can clean off most of the pH 4 solution. Next, you'll want to choose to add a calibration point, and you're going to change the actual value to 7. You're going to take the pH probe, and you're going to place it in the pH 7 buffer solution and begin to swirl until, again, this red bar rests near the middle of the wider green bar. Once that bar remains relatively stable, which you'll notice will also make this number here stay relatively stable, you can click OK, and it'll add your second calibration point. Again, we want to put our pH probe into the water so that we can clean off the buffer solution, and then we're going to choose to add a third and final calibration point. This time we're going to change our actual value to 10. We're going to take the pH probe out of the water and put it in the pH 10 buffer solution. Just like the other two solutions, we're waiting for this red bar to come into the middle of this wider green bar, and once it does, while we're swirling and swirling, we wait for it to stay relatively steady, and once it's steady, we can click OK for a third time. Finally, we want to take the pH probe out of the pH 10 buffer solution and swirl it in water again just to clean it up. Please make sure that when you're performing this experiment, you leave the pH probe in solution of some kind at all times so that it's not drying out. You're going to want to then click accept and save this calibration. You'll want to, before you click accept and save this calibration, click the first order linear fit to make sure that your R squared value is as close to one as possible. In this case, it is uh, five nines. Uh, so that's about as close as you can get to one without it actually being one. So we're happy with this calibration. So we're gonna click accept and save this calibration. We need to enter units for this calibration. We're measuring pH, so we want it to be pH. And then we need to name the uh, calibration for ourselves. So we're gonna do it, uh, I'm gonna name it video test for our video that we're showing you. Click save and finally click finish. Now you'll see we have a pH reading in the bottom corner and just to check our calibration, I'm gonna take my pH probe and put it in the pH seven buffer solution and swirl it around. And you'll see that it comes right down to around seven, which is a good sign. You'll notice, again, just like the conductivity probe, that the number is not perfectly stable. That last digit changes a little bit, but it's uh, never going to stop moving a little. So we can just take the average of the number that we see popping up, and we see everything around 7.0365 and 4. So I would record 7.035 for this experiment. The reason we perform this calibration in the case of this experiment is we want to make sure that our pH probe is working properly and that our pH probe in particular is measuring uh, 
its values the way that it does. So every pH probe is going to measure the various solutions slightly differently. So in order to get the most accurate reading possible, we want to make sure that our pH probe is calibrated for our solutions on the day we perform the experiment. So that's why we're going to do the calibration. It's also important to remember that when you're performing this experiment that you <clears throat> excuse me uh, use the provided uh, pH buffer solutions in the lab they'll be found on a shelf in the lab where you can get the pH 4 7 and 10 buffer solutions please don't try to make pH 4 7 and 10 buffer solutions as that can be quite complicated so now that you have an idea of the um overview of the experiment as well as how to uh, calibrate the sensor, the pH sensor for the microlab. What we want to do is go through uh, some mathematical examples. Now these mathematical examples, um, if you're new at this, are relatively complicated. And you may have done some of this kind of stuff in general chemistry, but maybe it's been a while or you don't remember or whatever. So what we're going to do is Tim and I are going to kind of switch back and forth. And we're going to show you, I'm going to show you these um, calculations uh, using TRIS as an example and TRIS HCL. And I'm going to show you them like on a piece of paper with writing and then he's going to show you how to do these calculations in excel and what we'll, you'll end up with is essentially an example of an excel file that does all the calculations that you need to do in the lab what won't be on the example excel file is the actual experimental stuff because you're actually going to measure the ph of the buffer solutions that you make and do statistics so standard deviation relative standard deviation percent error um, all that stuff to comment on the accuracy and the precision so we're not going to show you that because um, we showed you that in experiment one and you could go back to experiment one um, and watch that if uh, you would like but we are going to show you the buffer calculations which are specific to this experiment all right so now that i've talked enough about that let me get into the details so in your experiment you are going to be using uh, monobasic sodium phosphate as your acid and dibasic sodium phosphate as your base and you're going to need the um the molar masses of what is actually existed. So monobasic sodium phosphate is a monohydrate, so you need to consider that in your molar mass. And dibasic sodium phosphate is a heptahydrate, seven waters, and you need to consider that in your molar mass. In our case, we're going to use tris, this is tris, or, or this is tris, um, as our um, conjugate base, and then tris HCl, this is actually tris HCl, as our weak acid. So this is another common buffer solutions uh, used around biological pHs. Now in the lab, you're gonna make 250 milliliters of 0.25 molar monobasic sodium phosphate monohydrate and 250 milliliters of 0.250 molar dibasic sodium phosphate heptahydrate. In this example, we are going to make um, one, or oh, excuse me, 250 milliliters of a one molar solution. So it's not exactly the same what you're, as what you're going to do. But the mathematical process is exactly the same. So I'm going to do it first for TRIS, and then I'm going to show you the calculations for TRIS HCL because they're exactly the same. And we're going to figure out what's going on here. So what we want to do is we want to convert from liters of TRIS to moles of TRIS to grams of the trust that we need. So this is basically our plan of attack. So our goal here is to make 250 milliliters of a one molar Tris solution, and we need to figure out how many grams we need to add to our one um, to our 250 milliliter volumetric flask. In your case, again, you're going to make 250 milliliters of a 0.25 molar, but it doesn't make any difference what you're making. The only thing that'll change is the molarity and the molar mass. So let's look at how to do this. Well, we need to start with this volume in liters. We can't start with milliliters. So we have to divide by this, this by a thousand, which is 0 0.250 liters of Tris. So this is what we are going to use in our solution. And if we know it's going to be one molar, this means that one mole of Tris equals one liter of the Tris solution. In your case, you're asked for a 0.25 molar, which means 0.25 moles of what you're making equals one liter of what you're making. So this is what you're making. I'm gonna cross it out so we don't get confused. And this is what we're making in the example. So in this case, we wanna put the liter on the bottom so that liters cancel out. They're both one, so it doesn't really matter, but in your case, it will. So we put one liter of tris on the bottom and one mole 
of tris on the top. Now we want to convert from moles of tris to grams of tris, and there we need to use the molar mass. Well, it turns out that the molar mass of this is 121.14 grams of tris equals one mole of tris. And you could just look up your molar masses on Wikipedia or just ask Google, uh, whatever you want to do, um, but this is our molar mass here. Well, we want moles to cancel out, so we put the one mole of tris on the bottom, and on top we put the 121.14 grams of tris on the top. And this will allow us to make our stock solutions by adding 30.3 grams of tris. We multiply by the top, divide by the bottom, multiply by the top, divide by the bottom, and we find that 30.3 grams of tris will make it into a one liter volumetric flask, um, excuse me, a 250 milliliter volumetric flask will make our one molar solution. Now, you could do the exact same thing for tris HCl, liters of tris HCl to moles of tris HCl to grams of tris, tris HCl, which is exactly the same. The only difference is the molar mass here. Um, that's the only thing that changed. And you find that you need 39.4 grams of tris HCl. Now I'm going to turn it over to Tim, who's going to show you how you might be able to do this on an Excel sheet. So just like our previous experiments, I have a nice, clearly labeled, uh, well-documented Excel sheet all set up before I show up to lab. And again, it's certainly recommended to you that you have a similar, well-documented, ready-to-go Excel sheet before you spread come up to lab. You'll notice that on this Excel sheet, I actually have a large amount of it filled in already, and some of the math that we're going to be doing with the mass of Tris and Tris HCl needed, or in your case, the monobasic and dibasic sodium, uh, sodium phosphate solutions, I could even do that before lab too. So for now, what I'm going to show you is how to do the mass of Tris and Tris HCl uh, needed to make these solutions that Colin was just talking about. So if I go back to Colin's math real quick, you'll see that he took the desired volume, multiplied it by the desired concentration, and then multiplied that by the molar mass. So in Excel, I'm going to do the exact same thing. Just like always, I need to hit it equals in Excel in order to let it know I'm doing math. And I'm going to take my desired volume in liters, which is 0.250. I'm going to multiply that by my desired concentration, or 1. And then I'm going to multiply that by the molar mass of the tris. So this is the exact same math Colin just did. I'm just having Excel do that math for me. So when I hit enter, you'll see that my 30.285 is the same number as Colin's 30.3. He just rounded to three sig figs because we only have three significant figures in our volume measurement. So if I go back to the Excel, you'll see that I can do the exact same thing for the Tris HCl. I'll take our desired volume, multiply that by our desired concentration, and lastly multiply that by our molar mass. And again, you'll see that the number 39.4 is the same number that Colin got when he did this calculation. This is another piece of math that you could have done before you came to lab. I didn't need any measurements in lab or anything like that in order to figure out how to do this math. All of this can be done before I came in. So again, it's recommended that you do this for your stock solutions of monobasic and dibasic sodium phosphate before you come to lab. So now I'm going to turn it back over to Colin, who's going to talk, to, excuse me, who's going to walk you through making the buffer solution that you'll use to find the pKa, um, in our case of Tris, uh, and in your case, the monobasic sodium phosphate. So now that we have our stock solutions of Tris and Tris HCl, the next step is to determine the pKa of um, Tris. Now, this could, of course, be looked up, and this could be looked up for monobasic sodium phosphate as well. But the idea here is we want to use the experimental pKa um, that you find from the experiment. So we're going to basically do that. Well, if we have the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation here, we have pH equals pKa plus log Tris over Tris HCl. So this, in this case, is the base, A minus, and this is HA. So we want this log term to fall off so that pH equals pKa. So all we have to do is make a buffer solution where we stick in the pH probe and pH equals pKa. Whatever the pH reads, that is the pKa. That's our goal. Well, how do we do that? 
Well, what we need to do is we need to make an equal molar concentration. So if the concentration of Tris and the concentration of Tris HCl is the same, then this ratio becomes 1. So mathematically, the ratio will become 1. The log of 1 is 0. So when the log of 1 is 0, this all becomes 0. The pH equals the pKa as derived here. So in this um, example uh, calculations, we're asked to use our stock solutions to make 250 milliliters of 0.05 molar Tris S slash Tris HCl solution. In your actual um, lab experiment, that is not what you are making. Uh, what you are going to make is in the lab, you're going to make 50 milliliters of a 0.025 molar solution. But our goal is to make 250 milliliters of a 0.05 molar solution. Well, in order to do that, we first need to figure out how many moles of Tris and Tris HCl are required. So as a plan of attack, which may not be necessary because this is only a one-step uh, one conversion, we want to go from liters, and I'm just going to put up this case solution, to moles of Tris plus Tris HCl. So this is basically what we have to figure out. Well, we need we know how many liters of solution, 250 milliliters or divide by 1,000, 0 0.250 liters of solution times we know the molarity that we're trying to make. So the we could find the total number of moles of Tris and Tris HCl. So if it's 0.05 molar, that's 0.05 moles per liter. So we want 0 0.0500 moles of Tris plus Tris HCl per one liter of this solution. And when we do that math, we find out that there are that we need a total of 0.0 one two five moles of Tris and Tris HCl. So that's the total number of moles that we need. But if you remember when we discussed a minute ago the Henderson Hasselbach equation, we need the same number of moles of each of them. Said another way, half these moles should be Tris and half of these moles should be Tris HCl. So we just take that number and divide it by two and we find out that we need a total of 0 0.0625 moles of Tris and, sorry I missed a zero there, 0 0.00625 moles of Tris and 0 0.00625 moles of Tris HCl. So now we know the number of moles of Tris and Tris HCl. It's half of each, right? Half is Tris, half is Tris HCl. We add these two things together, we get this total number of moles. But we need to do the calculation to figure out what volume of our stock solution that we need. So if you'll recall, we made in the previous section of this video that we just went over a one molar stock solution. So now we need to figure out what volume of that one molar stock solution do we need in order to get this number of moles. Or said another way, we want to convert from moles of Tris or Tris HCl to liters of Tris or Tris HCl, the total amount of solution. Now whether you need a plan of attack for a one-step conversion is arguable. So you'll remember it's one molar that we have. So we have 1.0 molar Tris which means there's one mole per liter. Well, in this case, we want the number of moles on the bottom. So one mole of Tris and on top, one liter of solution. And when you do that math, you get 0 0.00625 liters of Tris. Now that may seem like a very small number, but you'll remember that that's in liters. So this is 6.25 milliliters. So that's the same volume. So what we would do is we would pipette in 6.25 milliliters of our stock Tris solution into our 250 milliliter flask. 
Now, we could do this exact same calculation for Tris HCl, but it's completely unnecessary because we want an equal amount of them and they happen to have the same concentration to begin with. Now, if they didn't have the same concentration to begin with, we could still make this solution, but we would actually have to do the math. But in this case, we don't really need to do the math because they're the same. We need 6.25 milliliters of Tris HCl. So how are we actually going to make this solution? We're going to pipette in 6.25 milliliters of the stock Tris solution, 6.25 milliliters of the stock Tris HCl solution into a 250 milliliter volumetric flask filled to the calibration line with water. Shake up the solution to mix it thoroughly and stick in the pH meter. When you do this, you now know the pKa, the experimental pKa of Tris and Tris HCl. I'll now turn it over to Tim, who will show you how this calculation can be done in Excel, which you could do before you come to lab. As Colin said, I'm going to go over the math in Excel with you. Uh, and again, you can set up a lot of this before you come into lab. If you notice, I already have filled in a few uh, cells here. I know before I come to lab what volume of the buffer solution I want to make, and I know the concentration of the buffer solution I want to make. And realistically, I can calculate these numbers before I come to lab too. They're just blank for now because I wanted to show you how to do this calculation in Excel. So the first thing is we need to figure out the total moles of solute. So if I go back to Colin's math, you'll notice that that was what he calculated here. He took the liters of solution that he was trying to make and multiplied it by the concentration of the solution in order to find the moles that would be present in that solution. So we're going to do the same thing. I'm going to take the liters of our buffer solution and multiply it by the concentration of our buffer solution to determine the number of moles of solute that we need, which, just like he said, was 0.125. Now you'll notice this number automatically changed to 0 0.00625, like Colin calculated. The reason for that is because before I entered that number, which if I hit Control Z and undo that entrance, you'll see that I have this uh, cell divided by 2 because I already know that I need an equimolar amount of both my acid and my conjugate base, in this case Tris and Tris HCl, or in your case the monobasic and dibasic sodium phosphate solutions. I already know I need the equimolar amount, so I know that I'm just going to be dividing the total number of moles by 2. So I have that set up ahead of time so that when I enter in my math here, where I multiplied these two numbers, sorry, where I multiply these two numbers when Excel lags, uh, sorry, when I multiply these two numbers and it fills that in automatically, it automatically fills in the number of each that I need as well. So now I need to determine the volume of the one molar stock solutions that I need, which I'll do the same way Colin did, where I take the moles uh, that I need and I multiply it by the molarity of my initial solution and then convert it into milliliters. So if I go back here, you'll see that I need to take this number, which is the number of moles of each solute I need, and multiply it by my stock concentration, which if I come up here, I have entered in already, and that'll give me my stock concentration needed in liters. You'll notice my stock concentration of Tris HCl also updated to be that same number, because again, I knew ahead of time that these numbers were going to have to be the same, because I needed an equimolar solution. You could do the same thing for your monobasic and dibasic sodium phosphate solutions. The next thing we'll want to do is we'll want to measure the pH like Colin said. In order to do the third portion of this experiment, I'm going to enter in a measured pH, which in the case of this experiment, we measured 8.13 as the pH of this buffer solution, which automatically updated my pKa to be the same value, which you'll remember from Colin's manipulation of the henderson hasselbeck equation, because the concentrations of my acid and conjugate base are the same, that means that the pH is directly equal to the pKa. Now the last thing I'm going to do is send it over to Colin again, where he'll go over with you how to make each of your uh, assigned pH solutions so that you can test and see if the henderson hasselbeck solution works for you to make a solution of a desired pH. So, 
we've already done a lot of math, and unfortunately now the math gets a little bit more complicated, if that didn't seem complicated enough for you. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to use the Henderson-Hasselbach equation to um, figure out a ratio based on a, an experimental pH provided by the TA. So if you remember a second ago, Tim told you that the um, pKa of this Tris, Tris HCl solution when we had a one to one ratio of the two uh, of the two molecules was 8.13 so this was the pH which equals the pH and the pKa so this is the pKa of tris tris HCl now we can make buffers with different um, pHs because that's a very useful thing to be able to do so for example if we wanted something that was more biological 7.4 we're going to do 7.5 as this example we could still make it with tris and tris HCl generally speaking as a gen very general rule of thumb you can go within plus or minus one of the pKa now your TA is going to give you a pH of um, monobasic and dibasic sodium phosphate solution uh, that you need to make and it should be within plus about plus or minus one of your experimental pKa and then you're going to experimentally or you're going to mathematically have to figure out how to make that solution then starting from the stock solution you're going to make it three times calculate the precision and the accuracy um, as well as test the buffer solution so in our case our goal is a buffer with a pH equal to 7.50 so the pKa of Tris, Tris HCl experimentally that we found is 8.13. And our goal is to make a buffer with a pH of 7.50. So we're going to use the Henderson-Hasselbach equation again. pH equals pKa plus log, whoops, that should be a log, of the concentration of Tris, the conjugate base, over Tris HCl, the weak acid. So this is the Henderson-Hasselbach equation. Well, you'll notice that we know two of the variables. We know pKa and we know pH. So we can plug those in. So we plug in the pH of 7.50 equals the pKa, which is 8.13, plus log of the concentration of Tris over the concentration of Tris HCl. Now, this may seem unsolvable at first, right? Because you have two variables, two concentrations. But what you want to think of is this whole thing is a variable. So our goal is to find the ratio of Tris to Tris HCl. So this whole thing is a variable. We can get rid of the log. So in order to do that, the first thing we want to do is subtract. So minus 8.13 minus 8.13. And we find, I'm just going to flip the equation around, the log of the concentration of Tris over the concentration of Tris HCl equals 7.5 minus 8.13, which is negative 0.63. Now we need to get rid of the log. Well, this is log base 10, so on your calculator you'd hit shift log, but we're going to take 10 to the log, which gets rid of the log, and we're going to take 10 to the negative 0.63, and we're going to find that the ratio of Tris to Tris HCl is equal to 0.23. So we now know using the Henderson-Hasselbach equation the ratio between Tris and Tris HCl. Unfortunately finding how much Tris and Tris HCl to actually add to the solution is a little bit complicated and we're going to go through that now. So now we have the concentration of Tris and Tris HCl. We need to um, remember that we need to actually find how many moles of Tris and how many moles of Tris HCl are required to make this solution. Well, fortunately, the ratio between Tris and Tris HCl is the same as the ratio of Tris to the ratio of Tris HCl in moles. So the ratio of concentrations and the ratio of moles, are, of moles are the same because they're in the same solution, or said another way, the total volume of the solution is constant. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to use this equation. So the moles of Tris over the moles of Tris HCl in the solution that we want to make, the ratio is 0.23. And now 
we could solve for the moles of Tris by simply cross multiplying by the moles of Tris HCl. So the moles of Tris equals 0 0.23 times the moles of Tris HCl. So now we have um, a mathematical equation that we can use. Notice that we have two variables. You may remember from algebra that in order to have two variables, when you have two variables, then you're going to also have um, need two equations to solve this. So this is one of the two equations that we're going to need to solve this. To find the other equation that we're going to need to solve this, we actually have to go back to some math that we did earlier. Earlier, we found that the total number of moles to make a uh, 250 milliliters of a 0.05 molar Tris Tris HCl solution was 0 0.0125 uh, moles. So this is the total number of moles of Tris and Tris HCl required. Now, but previously we mixed an equal number of moles of each, so we had actually divided the moles by two. But in this case, we need this ratio. So now we have two equations. The second equation that we need is that um, the moles of Tris plus the moles of Tris HCl equals 0 0.0125 moles. Now we have two equations and two variables. So now we're just doing the algebra. So instead of moles of Tris, we want to make a single variable by plugging in what the moles of Tris equals. So we replace moles of Tris with 0 0.23 moles of Tris HCl. So we put in 0 0.23 moles of Tris HCl plus the moles of Tris HCl equals 0 0.0125 moles. So now that we've plugged this in, we can simply add these together. This is just one mole of Tris HCl. So 0 0.23 plus one is 1.23 moles. Oops, I've been using N. Moles of Tris HCl equals 0 0.0125 moles. Then, Then we could simply divide both sides by 1.23, divide by 1.23, and we find the moles of Tris HCl is equal to 0 0.0102 moles. Finally, we need to find the moles of the Tris. Well, if the total number of moles is 1.025, and we know the moles of Tris HCl, we can essentially just plug back into this equation. Moles of Tris plus 0 0.0102 moles, that's the number of moles of Tris HCl that we just found, equals the total number of moles, equals 0 0.0125 moles. We can then simply subtract the 0 0.0102 moles and we find that the moles of Tris is equal to 0 0.0023 moles. So after doing quite a lot, large amount of complicated math, we find out that we need 0 0.0102 moles of Tris HCl and 0 0.0023 moles of Tris in our solution in order to make a buffer which has a pH of 7.50. Finally, I can convert this number of moles of Tris HCl and moles of Tris to a liter of stock solution. So in order to do that, I need to convert from moles of Tris HCl to liters of Tris HCl. Remember that um, the volume in liters is going to be very small, then we're going to actually use it in milliliters and use a pipette uh, in order to make the transfer. So we'll, we're I guess lucky that it's a one molar solution. So what we want to do is have one liter of Tris HCl and every one liter of this particular Tris HCl contains one mole I apologize there. It's actually for every um, one liter of Tris HCl that should actually be on the top because I'm trying to get moles of Tris HCl to cancel out. 
every one liter contains one mole of trace HCl because it's a one molar solution. So when I do that, I get the same number because this is one over one, which is 0 0.0102 liters of tris HCl. And when I multiply that by a thousand, I get 10.2 milliliters. When I repeat that exact same math for moles of tris to liters of tris, I um, again use the molarity as one over one, one mole on the bottom, one liter on the top, and I get 2.3 milliliters. So essentially, at the end of the day, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get a 250 milliliter volumetric fat, flask, pipette in 10.2 milliliters of tris HCl, then pipette in 2.3 milliliters of tris, fill the so, uh, fill the flask, the volumetric flask to the calibration line, shake it, and measure the pH. The pH should be close to 7.50. In your experiment, you're going to make your solutions, starting from your stock solutions, three times, and measure the pH of each, calculate the accuracy and precision, and then finally test them uh, by adding acids and bases. Now I'm going to turn it over to Tim, who's going to show you how to do this math uh, using an Excel sheet um, and th that you can uh, have done before you come to lab. So the last thing we're going to do is go over how to do these calculations in Excel. So you'll notice in Excel I have my assigned pH and I have the pKa that I determined from before, which if you look in my equation line up here, my 8.13 is actually just entered in from uh, the cell where I measured the pH. My assigned pH I had to type in after my TA told me what my assigned pH was. So now what I need to do is I need to determine, a th the, do the math essentially that Colin just did before. So the first thing I need to do is determine my log ratio uh, using the same math that Colin had done before. So if you'll remember, the math that Colin did before was that he took the log ratio was solved by taking the target pH and subtracting the pKa. So I can do that exact same math here. I can take my target pH and subtract my experimental pKa value and get, just like he did in the math that he showed you, negative 0.63. Again, after we do that, I need to take that number and raise 10 to that power. So that'll give me my ratio of my concentrations. So I can do that in Excel by hitting equals, doing 10 to the power, which is done by shift six, the caret symbol, and then selecting the log ratio so that my Excel sheet will fill out the ratio needed. Now, of course, I don't need to use 27 uh, significant figures like they do here, so I'm gonna shorten that down to a more reasonable uh, three significant figures uh, because that's about how many we've been working with throughout this entire experiment. Now you'll notice I have my total moles filled in already because that number hasn't changed uh, from my initial buffer solution because the total concentration still needs to be 0 0.05 molar. So just like Colin figured out before, uh, the or reminded you before, the total moles needed is that number. Now I'm going to do some of the other math that Colin did as well. So if I come down here, you'll see that Colin solved for the... <clears throat> excuse me, the moles of Tris HCl needed by taking the total number of moles and dividing by 1.23 because that was the sum of the one mole of Tris and the 0.23 moles of Tris HCl needed uh, when we substituted in 0.23 times Tris HCl for the amount of Tris. So I'm going to do that exact math in Excel. So I'm going to do an equal sign and I'm going to divide my total number and I'm going to do 1 plus my ratio, because that's how much we're going to have. Uh, if you'll remember, we have 1 Tris HCl plus the ratio of Tris HCl in the math that Colin showed you. So we'll have to divide by that number. Oh, excuse me, it didn't. I didn't hit my divide symbol. So I'll have my total moles divided by 1 plus my mole ratio, which will tell me that the total moles of Tris HCl I need is 0 0.0101 just like Colin calculated. Again, I'm going to get rid of some of the uh, sig figs. So if we look at 
the moles of tris needed, that number's already filled itself in, because if you'll notice, I already have it set to take my total moles and subtract out the moles of tris HCl, because again, our moles of tris HCl and our moles of tris need to add up to be a total of 0 0.0125 moles, so that means I can ahead of time have it set up to subtract that number out. So we'll need, in this case, once I lower down this number of sig figs, 0 0.00237 moles of tris. The last thing I need to do is convert those numbers into volumes. So just like Colin did, I'm going to take my moles of tris. Uh, I have tris done first here, so I'm going to take my moles of tris. I'm going to multiply that by the molarity of my stock solution, which is 1, found all the way at the top of my sheet. And then I'm going to convert it to... Uh, milliliters in my head because we know that this is a volume in liters as indicated by the unit that I have indicated on my Excel spreadsheet which once we convert this if you move that decimal point over three times you'll see that we need about 0.237 milliliters of or 2.37 milliliters so I can do the exact same math for this solution I just need to multiply by the moles of Tris HCl and multiply the molarity of my Tris HCl solution, which will give me a total uh, volume, once we make our significant figures a little bit more reasonable, of 10.13 or 10.2, give or take, milliliters of solution. So, if you notice, the only value on this entire sheet that I couldn't have entered before I came to lab was my assigned pH. All of these values can all or rather all of these equations can be entered into my excel spreadsheet ahead of time and then once i fill in my assigned ph they'll all fill themselves out if you notice if i delete that number they just go to zero and then when i enter in my assigned ph all those numbers fill themselves in the only spots on this sheet that would need to be blank before i walked into the room are my measured ph and therefore my pka of the tris and my assigned pH and experimental pKa of the Tris. But again, you can even set it up so that the pKa and experimental pKa fill themselves out automatically when I enter in the measured pH of the buffer solution. So all of that math can be set up to be done before you came into lab. Now, I've only done one uh, assigned pH solution here because this is the math for how to make that assigned pH solution, but experimentally in the class, you're going to make this solution here using these volumes three separate times. And then you're going to measure the pH of those three, and you're going to determine the accuracy and precision of the uh, pH value that you measure. Uh, for the accuracy, when you do percent error, you're going to want to use your assigned pH uh, in order to, uh, as your... Um, your theoretical value uh, for when you do the percent error calculations and you'll want to calculate both the RSD and percent error of your pHs over your three solutions. Once you've done that, uh, remember that you actually have one more step where you're going to take your uh, buffer solutions, you can choose any of the three, and you're going to test it by using the uh, diluted solution of HCl and NaOH that you'll make from uh, stock 12 molar H NaO or HCl and solid NaOH in class, and you'll test the buffer using those solutions uh, versus putting those same solutions into a simple salt water uh, solution. And you'll have to comment on your results sheet here uh, relative to what you observe when you add the acid and base to both the buffer and the salt water solutions. There is a lot to do in this experiment and a lot of math, so it's really in your best interest to do this ahead of time so that you're as prepared as possible when you come to lab, so you have to do the least amount of math possible. Because you'll notice if all this math is done ahead of time, all I need to do is measure these two masses to make these solutions, measure these two volumes to make the buffer solution, and then measure these two volumes three times. So there's not that much to do uh, physically to make these solutions as long as you have all of the math done ahead of time. So we recommend in this case, just as in every case, you have as much of this math done before you come to lab as possible.